Hi, my name is David House, and I'd like to welcome you to our all-new video series, The Complete History of the United States. In this, the third video in our series, we'll cover the growth and development of a new nation. We'll begin by looking at George Washington, the first president of the United States. Then we'll journey through history to end up with the election of 1796 and the presidency of John Adams. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's begin. The first president under the new constitution was George Washington, often called the father of our country. Washington took the oath of office on April 30th, 1789. This hero of the Revolutionary War was chosen by all members of the Electoral College. The people admired the courage and leadership Washington provided in the Revolutionary War. They believed they could trust him as a politician. Washington believed it was important to unite the new nation and to make sure the government ran smoothly. He didn't try to gain power for himself. Americans celebrate Washington's birthday with a national holiday called President's Day remembering how his great leadership helped establish the United States. The way Washington set up his government was very important. He established precedents that new presidents followed. One precedent was the establishment of the cabinet, a group of advisors for the president. The cabinet had four men, each with a different responsibility. There was a secretary of state, responsible for foreign policy, a secretary of the treasury, responsible for money matters. There was a secretary of war, responsible for army and navy, and an attorney general responsible for legal matters. Today's cabinet has more members and additional functions. A second important precedent was that Washington followed the loose interpretation of the Constitution. This can be seen in some of the controversial actions taken during Washington's term. An important problem for the new government was organizing its finances. Alexander Hamilton had a plan that would establish the credit of the United States at home and in other countries, encourage manufacturing, and provide a stable currency. Washington and the Congress agreed with Hamilton that the federal government assume the debts of the Revolutionary War. They also started tariffs and taxes on imports and some agricultural products to raise funds and encourage manufacturing in the U.S. The most controversial issue was Hamilton's special project, the National Bank. Hamilton believed a national bank was necessary to stabilize the national currency and to provide loans for manufacturing and other businesses. The Anti-Federalists were very angry. They saw this national bank as exactly what they had feared from a strong federal government. They felt it could control the money supply, destroy state banks, and claim all surplus government funds. Some of the anti-federalist fears have come to pass. But these policies and institutions are now viewed as indispensable to the smooth working of the national economy, regulation of trade, and collection of taxes. The disagreement over these issues, especially financial matters, divided politicians into two groups or parties. The Federalists and Democratic Republicans formed the first political parties in the United States, and the two-party system has provided the basis for the U.S. government. They are the Republicans, Federalists, and the Democrats, Democratic Republicans. There are other political parties also. Having more than one party keeps the political system open and balanced. Conduct of foreign policy was not as controversial an issue as financial matters in some ways. Both the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans agreed that the United States should remain neutral. 
as much as possible, in its relationships with other countries. In those times, the two oceans which separated the United States from Europe and Asia took weeks or months to cross. The Americans liked it that way because they could keep out of the struggles and fights of other countries and develop the American way of life without interference. Neutrality meant staying out of European politics. It did not mean complete separation from Europe. The Americans still wanted very much to trade with Europe because it provided a large market for U.S. agricultural goods. The United States often has worked to uphold neutral trade rights, even in times of war, as part of the belief that neutrality is to be honored by all nations. George Washington was a very popular president, respected even by his opponents. He was by nature a quiet man who didn't like the political struggles that grew during his second term. He decided to retire in 1796 and set an important precedent for the two-term presidency. It showed that the republic was more important than the men who made it. No person would keep all the power, the authority was in the institutions. Washington's farewell address, written before he retired, gave advice to the nation for the future. It had a great influence on the country's foreign policy. Washington emphasized that the U.S. should stay neutral in its political relationships with other countries. This policy of isolation would be followed by the U.S. for more than 100 years. Controversy and heated debate existed during the election in 1796. The Democratic Republicans with Thomas Jefferson as presidential candidate and the Federalists with John Adams as presidential candidate spoke to each other only during debates. Thomas Jefferson, who had the second largest number of votes in the Electoral College, became vice president. Adams had a difficult time in his presidency. It would have been hard for anyone to follow the popular Washington, but it was especially hard for Adams. People saw him as experienced and principled, but also as tactless and proud. In addition, Jefferson, his bitter political foe, was vice president. Also, some members of Adams' own party were plotting against him. The major issues of Adams' administration were carryovers from Washington. Washington's proclamation of neutrality said the U.S. would stay out of European affairs as much as possible. Most Americans agreed, but usually favored the French or the British for trade relations. The British began to violate America's neutral status by seizing merchant ships, both for the men and the goods. Many Americans believed, because of these violations, that the U.S. should side with France against England. Fortunately, a treaty was negotiated with the British instead of going to war. This action upset the French, and they began seizing American ships. Now the people who did not like the French called for the U.S. to side with Britain. At great risk to his popularity, he negotiated with both the French and the British to keep America out of the conflict. At the time, many felt Adams had deprived them of the chance to go to war with the French. Years later, Adams' ability to keep the peace is seen as the greatest accomplishment or achievement of his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> 